How is it going, everybody? Welcome back to Bark Forge. Today's going to be episode two of the Dana 30 Axle Build Project. Now, if you missed episode one, uh, what we did was strip down the axle. This is out of my Jeep Cherokee. Removed all the internals except for the uh, pinion seal and the bearing raises. We cut and turned the axle tubes to correct our caster angle, welded those back on. Um, welded on an axle truss and an upper control arm mount uh, gusset and finally installed a set of axle sleeves. In this episode we're going to be going over how to basically put the diff back together. Um, I got a brand new Dana 30 rebuild kit from Yukon Gear and Axle. It's got 456 gears, uh, comes with quality Timken bearings, bearing raises, uh, etc. Uh, new seals and we're also going to go over how to set up the diff in terms of uh, backlash, pinion depth, and to do that, we're going to make a set of uh, dummy bearings and dummy bearing races uh, so that we can easily adjust um, all of these aspects of the diff. So I'm going to go over how exactly to make those and just let you know what you should be buying before you tackle the project. And lastly, we are going to be installing the Powertrax No Slip Automatic Diff Locker. So what needs to be done next is we're going to have to remove the rear pinion seal and start punching out the bearing races. Removing the uh, rear pinion seal is pretty easy. You just need to get in there with either a pry bar like you see here or a big flathead screwdriver and you can just pop it right out. Once you get it out, just go back in there uh, and make sure you clean up the mating surface uh, that the seal is sealed against because there's going to be some old uh, RTV or gasket maker in there. Once that's done, you can remove the baffle like you see here. Um, some people debate on whether or not that's necessary. but the kit came with it, so we're going to put it back in. And then you can take out the rear pinion bearing. So to punch out uh, the bearing races, you're going to need a brass punch. Um, and you're just going to knock them out from the back, like you see here. Uh, the reason you need a brass punch is because a brass punch won't mar uh, the inner seat that the bearing races sit in. Um, a steel punch will do that. So you want to make sure it's a brass punch. So once you've knocked out the races and you've cleaned up the seats where they get pressed into, uh, it's going to be time to install the new races. This is pretty simple. Uh, you just need to buy a bearing race and a seal driver set. And it's basically just a tool that's going to allow you to put even pressure on the races and pound them into place. The key to using the bearing race driver is just to make sure that you're pounding the bearing race in perfectly straight. Um, and you're going to feel a difference uh, once the bearing race actually bottoms out on the housing. Uh, the sound will change and the feeling of the tool will change. That's how you'll know you're done. And just double check that it's nice and even all the way around. For the inner pinion bearing race, uh, you're going to want to make sure you put in your new oil baffle. The original one obviously gets damaged when you pound out the bearing race. So put your new one in, make sure it's facing the same way the old one was and you're going to want to hammer in this bearing race uh, the same way you did the outer bearing race. So now it's time to set up our new pinion, but first we need to remove the old bearing uh, off of the old pinion so that we can get to the shim stack between the oil slinger um, and the pinion itself. This is going to give us a uh, baseline for setting our pinion uh, depth. Uh, the reason we want uh, that original shim sack is so we can measure those shims um, and set up our new pinion the same way and possibly making a couple adjustments to account for a difference in size of our new pinion compared to our old pinion. So here I'm just using a uh, cheap bearing puller tool um, in combination with my shop press to actually remove the bearing from the pinion. With the bearing removed, we can now remove the oil slinger, which is the large disc on the pinion. And there's a couple ways you can go about setting pinion depth. Um, technically, only two of them are the right way. You could find your pinion depth using a pinion depth tool, which is an expensive tool and it's kind of tricky to use. Um, or you could compare the markings on your original pinion versus your new pinion. There's a couple numbers etched into the top of the pinion gear um, and using those numbers you can figure out what the uh, original depth offset was and adjust your new pinion based on the number on the new pinion. Now I found this method to be a little confusing. I couldn't find online a really clear way uh, that made sense to me to, to figure that out. And on top of that the numbers that were actually etched 
into my opinion, my original one, were very hard to make out. So I went with option three, which is, you know, the option that a lot of DIY people go with, which is simply to manually measure the uh, thickness of your pinion gear. So what I'm doing here is I'm measuring the thickness of the original pinion. Uh, I'm going to write down that number, and then I'm going to measure the thickness of the new pinion. Uh, it's a little tricky to get the calipers to sit nice, uh, and, and there is a margin of error there. So, you know, that, that you have to consider that. And again, if you're doing this at home, you have to consider that there's a margin of error overall. Um, you know, you're doing a job that usually is done by a professional. So we can see here that there is a 5,000th difference in thickness between my original pinion and my new pinion. Uh, the new pinion is shallower, which means that it's not going to sit as deep into the case. It's not going to uh, be as close to the carrier and the ring gear as the original was. So to compensate for that, we need to add five thousandths of shim uh, behind the pinion so that it's pushed towards the ring gear. Now, it was at this point that I realized that the kit that I bought um, did not actually come with shims that were meant to go on the pinion itself between the pinion and the pinion bearing. The kit came with shims that go between the inner pinion bearing race and the diff housing which is what I'm holding in my hand now. They're a larger, thinner shim, similar to the size of the carrier bearing shims. So, if your kit has a similar style to this, that means that you need to make a dummy pinion bearing race. Unfortunately, I didn't film this part, um, and I was a little pissed off because I had already installed my final uh, inner pinion bearing race, as you just saw. So, I had to gently pound that out, and then make a dummy bearing race. Uh, so to do that, all you really need to do is buy uh, a cheap bearing race. You can get the Duralast or whatever else. You know, you don't need to buy the nice Timken bearing race for this. And what you need to do is, using your belt grinder or whatever you have, uh, shave down the outer diameter of that bearing race so that, so that it just slides right into the seat in the housing uh, easily. So this is going to allow you to insert and then remove that bearing race over and over so that you can add or remove shims and set your pinion depth appropriately based on the gear pattern you're going to check later on uh, once the carrier and the ring gear is installed. So like I said, I neglected to film it, but uh, you can see in this frame here, I'm holding the setup bearing race that I made and you can see that the outside of it is all ground down and that allows it to easily slide right into the race seat. Now, keep in mind, um, if your Dana 30 came with shims between the pinion and the pinion bearing, like I was expecting, um, you're simply going to have to take those shims into account when you do your calculation. So, instead of measuring just the pinion, uh, like I did, you're going to be measuring the pinion and the shim stack all at the same time, uh, or measure them separately and add the numbers together. And your ultimate goal is to make sure your new pinion depth matches your original pinion depth um, using shims between the pinion and the pinion bearing instead of shims behind the pinion bearing race. In my case, because I had a 5,000th difference, I put a 5,000th shim between the pinion bearing race and the housing, and then inserted my uh, setup pinion bearing race. At this point, you're ready to uh, put the pinion back together. Um, since we don't require any shims on the pinion in this case, now again, could be different for you, you might, but since I didn't require any shims on the pinion, um, I could go ahead and do the final install of the oil slinger and the inner pinion bearing. Now, at this point, you'll find that if you don't own the correct tool for pressing on a pinion bearing, um, it's going to be tough to find something that's long enough and the right size to uh, press the bearing onto the pinion, um, but fit around the shaft of the pinion so that you're only pressing on the inside of the bearing and not on the bearing cage. Because if you press down on the bearing cage, you're going to destroy the bearing. So in this case, instead of buying a special tool just to press on this one bearing, um, I found it easier to actually just reuse the original pinion bearing off of my original pinion. Uh, so all you really need to do is cut the cage off of the bearing, get rid of all the rollers, and then you're left with just the inside of the bearing. And that piece is going to be the perfect size uh, for you to use to press on your new bearing onto your new pinion. So now that your pinion's back together, now it's time to find our baseline for our pinion preload shims. Uh, 
Uh, the Dana 30 is a uh, shim style preload design, not a crush sleeve style. So in order for us to find our baseline for our preload, we need to measure the original shim stack that was on the back of the pinion. Um, so here I'm just cleaning off all the shims, and then I'm going to measure them and get an overall dimension uh, for how big that shim stack was. Once you have that overall dimension, um, basically assemble a, a, a new shim stack with your new shims from the kit that's going to be the same thickness, and that's going to be your baseline for pinion preload. Now it's time to make your pinion setup bearing, uh, because in order to properly set the preload, uh, you're going to have to insert and remove the pinion a few times. Um, and this bearing isn't necessarily pressed on, but it is on there very tight, uh, and it's actually pulled onto the shaft when you tighten down the yoke nut. So, so all I did here was buy another cheap Duralast bearing, and I'm actually going to go around and hollow out the inside of the bearing until it's just wide enough so that the bearing slips right onto the uh, pinion uh, without any friction. And here you can actually see where your pinion preload shims are going to sit. Uh, they sit right between that little shelf on the shaft and the uh, rear pinion bearing. Now you can go ahead and reinstall the pinion. Uh, there's no reason to install the seal just yet because the pinion will likely have to be removed several times for you to set the preload correctly. So you're going to want to insert the pinion, uh, then slide your shim stack over the pinion shaft. Uh, slide on your setup bearing. And then you can go ahead and slide on uh, the yoke, slide on the washer, and then thread on your original pinion nut, not your new pinion nut. Uh, the reason for that is because the pinion nut is actually uh, a lock nut. It's kind of slightly out of round. Uh, so when you thread on that nut, it deforms the nut, and that's what allows it to grab on and, and not come loose. So you're going to want to use your original pinion nut for testing. Uh, so that you don't uh, deform your new pinion nut before your final installation. So the new pinion nut is only going to go on when everything is perfectly adjusted and ready to go back together permanently. So now you're going to want to torque down uh, the pinion nut, and you're going to want to go very slow. You're not torquing it to a specific spec just yet, since we're not actually worried about adjusting the preload right now. You're basically just going to tighten it down until the yoke gets snug. Uh, you don't want to have any play in the yoke or in the pinion. Um, if you've tightened it to the point where the pinion is now really difficult to turn, you've gone too far. So you want to be really careful here and just tighten it enough that, uh, so that there's no play in the shaft. So at this point we can uh, finally turn our attention to the carrier, the ring gear, and the locker. Um, now if you're going to a 456 gear on the Dana 30, keep in mind you are going to have to buy a larger carrier. I don't remember the exact size, but you can find that info online. Um, I ordered it along with my uh, Yukon gear kit. In addition, if you're planning on installing a locker, um, I'm installing an automatic locker in this case, uh, you likely also won't need to disassemble your original carrier or ring gear whatsoever. However, if you're not installing a locker, um, you're going to need to remove the spider gears and the cross pin from your original carrier so that you can put them in the new carrier. Installing the power tracks is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, you're first just going to take the uh, four uh, major parts of the locker and you're going to grease up the teeth uh, so that there's less friction as they uh, cam against one another. And then you're going to take the uh, inner collar and line it up with the large gap in the teeth right where I'm pointing. There's a large hole right there um, that this collar can actually fit right into. So uh, it's the same on both sides. You just press that right in there. Once you've greased up all the teeth on the locker, uh, you're then going to take some grease and put it inside of the holes uh, that all the springs sit inside. Uh, and that's because that grease is going to help those springs. Um, it's going to help those springs stay in there and it's also going to reduce the friction as they compress and decompress. You're also going to want to get some grease on the springs and then you can start inserting uh, the springs into the holes. So the uh, the medium sized springs are going to go on these center holes. There should be eight of them, four on each side. And those are what press up against the center pin. So next you're going to want to install one of the outer halves of the locker into the carrier. Um, it's important to make sure that that notch, you can see where the arrow is, uh, that large notch 
on the inside of the locker is facing you when you place the locker inside of the carrier. Next, you're gonna place in the other side. Um, however, this time, and double check the directions, but I'm pretty sure this time, the instructions say to place it in with the notch facing away from you, uh, so that the notches on each half are facing the opposite direction. So now you're gonna install the inner halves of the locker. Um, similar deal to the other ones, uh, these have to be installed facing opposite directions. Um, this one's a little bit easier though, because they won't fit. If you uh, if you don't do that, so it's pretty obvious which way they go in. Next, you're going to install the remaining springs. Um, there should be four. There should be two large springs and two tall skinny springs. Uh, the tall skinny spring actually goes inside of the large spring, and then together they're inserted into the side of the locker. Uh, I guess the camera must have cut out, but. Uh, the final step after this is to simply uh, check the gap between the two halves with this little clearance tool that they give you just to make sure everything is lined up right. Um, reinsert the cross pin and then reinsert the pin that holds in the cross pin and then you're going to be ready to install the ring gear. Mounting the ring gear is pretty simple. Um, I chose to uh, thread on a couple bolts but you'll find that you kind of need to press the ring gear um, onto the carrier. Uh, and obviously there's no really there's no real way to do that. They ne it needs to be pulled onto the carrier by the bolts. Uh, but I chose to kind of get it started with a mallet and and just kind of go around the exterior and try to evenly give it a few taps with the mallet to get it started. That way, when you uh, when you begin to tighten the bolts, it's going to go down nice and straight. Once you get it started, you can uh, install all the bolts, and then with a wrench, just go around, um, crisscross on opposite sides, and slowly torque the bolts down, and that's going to draw the ring gear all the way up against the carrier. Um, and then once it's fully seated, you can go around with your torque wrench, uh, and marking every single bolt, uh, same deal crisscross, you'll torque down the bolts to the final uh, torque. And I think in this case, the torque was 60 or 65 foot-pounds. It's also not a bad idea to uh, put some red Loctite on all these bolts as well, just for some extra security. So next up, we need to go back to our original carrier and pull the bearings off. Uh, and the reason we need to do that is very similar to what we did with the pinion. We have to measure the original shims uh, that were between the carrier bearings and the carrier. That way we can get a baseline for our new carrier uh, preload setting. So to do that, I'm just using a cheap bearing puller and a socket uh, to pull this off. Once you get the bearings pulled off, uh, you'll have access to the stack of shims that were pressed underneath. Uh, so here I'm just measuring the stack. Uh, on my little sheet there I've got uh, ring gear side and non-ring gear side. So right now we're measuring the non-ring gear side and I'm just adding up all the thicknesses of the shims. My final reading was 0.055 on the ring gear side and 0.04 on the non-ring gear side. However, uh, I'm actually going to be adding I'm actually going to be adding, I think, three thousandths to each side, um, and that's recommended uh, in the Yukon manual uh, because it compensates for the amount that the bearings have actually settled into the races. But before we can actually install the new bearings and put our new shim stack in, obviously we have to make setup bearings again because uh, we're going to be removing and replacing these bearings as we go back and forth setting uh, the backlash. And I do want to point out here, um, it's totally acceptable to use your original bearings as setup bearings if you're able to remove them without destroying the cages. Um, it's just very difficult to do that, which is the reason I went and bought uh, cheapo bearings to make uh, my setup bearings out of. So once your new setup bearings uh, fit nice and easy over the carrier, you can drop on your new shim stack um, and install the carrier into the diff housing. Uh, now keep in mind, you want the carrier to, to fit snugly in the housing, but you don't want to have to hammer it in at this point since you're going to be putting in the carrier and removing it several times. So if it's too snug, uh, just remove an equal amount of uh, shim from either side until it fits in the carrier nice and easily. Next, you can reinstall your bearing caps. Now, remember, uh, 
the bearing caps are supposed to be situated a certain way um, and you're going to use either the marks you made or the marks that were already stamped onto the caps and the housing to figure out which way the caps are going to be reinstalled. Uh, and then you're going to go ahead and torque these down to the recommended amount in the manual. I also want to point out that uh, once things start getting torqued and you're starting your tests, um, you always want to put some lubricant on all the bearings, so either some gear oil uh, or some break-in lube uh, to make sure that none of the bearings are getting uh, scored or anything prematurely. So now we're ready to test our backlash, and the backlash is going to be set um, by the position of the carrier and the ring gear uh, left and right in the diff case. So. Uh, as you move the ring gear toward the pinion, you're going to reduce your backlash, and as you move the ring gear away from the pinion, you're going to increase the backlash. And those adjustments are made by the shims that we're putting between the carrier bearings and the carrier. So uh, you're going to want to set up your dial indicator, and ideally we're looking for between six and eight uh, thousandths of an inch of backlash between the ring gear and the pinion. Testing the backlash is pretty simple. You're just going to uh, make sure that the yoke, the pinion yoke, can't move, so you could just hold it in your hand, and then just wiggle the ring gear back and forth and see how much play there is, and watch the dial indicator uh, to get your measurement. So this part can be a little time consuming. It's going to take a few tries to get the measurement right. Um, if you don't have enough backlash, as in the ring gear and the pinion are right up against one another, there's no play, you're going to want to move them apart. Now the Yukon uh, manual recommends how much adjustment to make based on how much backlash you have or need. Um, but just in this example, you know, if they're too close, let's say you might want to add three thousandths on the non ring gear side and take away three thousandths on the ring gear side, uh, as long as you do it evenly. So that's going to move it away six thousandths. Um, if you need less, you can do one thousandths on one side. Uh, if you need more, you can do five or ten thousandths. Um, and it works the same in the opposite way if you need to move the ring gear closer to the pinion. Uh, so basically, you're just going to go back and forth adding and removing shims uh, until you get your backlash to be between six and eight thousandths of an inch. Now, once you have your backlash set, uh, it's time to check your gear pattern uh, and set your pinion depth. Uh, and set your pinion depth. Uh, I found this to be the hardest part of the whole process because uh, what you need to do is you know paint the gear compound onto the gear. Uh, and then using your hand, run the ring gear over the pinion back and forth several times uh, while providing resistance on the pinion yoke uh, to simulate driving. Um, do that several times and develop uh, a pattern on the gear that you can actually see. Uh, and once you have the pattern, you can compare that pattern to the uh, manual that the gears come with to see whether or not you need to add pinion depth or take away pinion depth. I found this part pretty tough because um, it was really hard for me to sometimes compare the actual gear pattern with the illustrations in the manual. Um, you know, sometimes my, pannier, my pattern didn't look like anything in the manual or I thought it looked like one illustration, but it turns out it was closer to another, so I would move the pinion the wrong way. Uh, but long story short, um, this takes up the most time because every time you test it, you need to remove the bearing caps, uh, you need to remove the carrier. Uh, you need to remove the pinion and the pinion nut and all that, and you need to change the shims that are underneath uh, that setup bearing race that we installed uh, earlier in the process. So uh, you take apart the entire system, uh, add or remove shims behind that bearing race. Um, adding shims is going to uh, push the pinion out toward the carrier, and then removing them is going to pull the pinion away. Uh, and you're going to do the same process until you get an acceptable pattern. There's several examples of acceptable patterns in the manual that the gears come with. Um, and just as a reminder, make sure you are always putting back the uh, oil baffle that's, uh, that goes along with the shim stack behind that bearing race. So this process, it's really just important that you take your time and do it as many times as you need. Um, if it's the first time you're doing this like it was for me, it's probably going to take you several tries to get it right. Um, but getting it right is going to ensure the proper operation of your gears and the long life of your gears. So here I'm just reinstalling the uh, carrier yet again. I think it probably took me about six or seven tries to get this right. Uh, but I did eventually get a pattern that I was happy with.
So once your pattern is set, uh, you can remove your setup gears um, and grab the gears that you're going to be using for the final install and press those onto the carrier. Um, now, if you remember earlier, we made sure that the carrier was just barely snug inside of the case for easy uh, installation and removal while setting the backlash, etc. But uh, now we need to make sure that the bearings have a proper preload. Uh, so to do this, you're going to be adding an equal amount of shimming on both sides so that the carrier fits way more snug in the case. Um, and ideally you have to use a mallet to, to get it in there. The manual will have the uh, appropriate size shims. I think it was I think it was small. I think it was a few thousandths on each side to get it to fit snugly. But as a rule of thumb, if you can just drop the carrier right into the case, um, you definitely don't have enough pinion preload. Um, you want to be able to uh, tap it in with a mallet um, and you ideally would need to use a pry bar or something to remove it. So now it's time to finally set our pinion preload. Uh, and this is done with that uh, stack of small shims on the pinion shaft itself. So uh, earlier we, we matched the original shim stack and now we're going to test it uh, to see if we have a proper preload. Uh, the way you measure pinion preload is you use an inch pound torque wrench, um, a beam style. And again, using your original pinion nut, uh, you're going to torque down the pinion to the final torque rating, which I believe is 250 pounds. Uh, double check depending on what axle you're running. Um, and then once your pinion is torqued down, there should be a certain resistance to uh, turning. And that is your pinion preload. So uh, you use the uh, inch pound torque wrench to measure that. We're looking for between 12 and 15 foot pounds of resistance. So if you measure it more than 15 foot pounds, you have too much pinion preload and you're going to want to add shims on the pinion. If you don't have enough uh, pinion preload, you're going to take away shims. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to allow those two bearings to draw closer to one another and have a tighter fit inside of the case, thus increasing your preload. Once your preload is set correctly, um, you're going to want to take everything apart and uh, we're going to do the final install of everything in the diff. So. Uh, I started with putting all my seals in using the seal driver set. These seals do come with a small amount of RTV along the outside, but uh, I used a little bit extra uh, gear oil gasket maker just in case to make sure that it's not going to leak. So you're going to want to install both of your axle seals. Uh, you're going to want to remove the setup bearing race that you used earlier and pound in your uh, final install bearing race. You're also going to install your pinion seal, um, and if you are choosing to reinstall the uh, small oil baffle on the pinion, make sure you put it inside before you put the seal on because the baffle is larger than the hole in the seal, so you're not going to be able to get it in after. You can, however, fit your shim stack uh, through the hole, so don't worry about that. Um, you're also going to have to make sure that your uh, final install rear pinion bearing is placed in there as well because that is not going to fit through the pinion seal. So for the final installation of the uh, pinion and the yoke, you're going to want to put on your new washer, you're going to want to grab your new nut, and you're going to want to put some lubricant between the nut and the washer so that you're going to get the most uh, accurate torque. Uh, and you're also going to want to put some red Loctite on the pinion threads. So what you're going to do is uh, use a, you can use an impact to pull the yoke onto the pinion, uh, and that's going to press that bearing into the pinion and then go ahead and grab your torque wrench and torque down to the appropriate torque 250 foot pounds at this point i do one final check to make sure that my pinion preload is still correct um, with the new uh, bearings in there and then i'm going to move on to installing the carrier with the uh, carrier bearing preload set correctly um, it's pretty snug so i uh, tapped in the whole assembly with a mallet and then I'm going to get to installing the uh, bearing caps. This is also a good opportunity to do one final check and just make sure that your backlash is still set correctly. So at this point, you're pretty much done. Uh, you're just going to want to make sure all your bolt holes are clean. Um, you're going to install your gasket and your diff cover. Uh, and then the only thing left to do is uh, reinstall your axles and fill up the diff. Uh, Yukon Gears recommends a 500 mile break-in period, so um, for the first 500 miles they kind of just tell you to take it easy, 
Um, you know, don't go crazy on the gas, don't tow anything, stuff like that. Um, and at the end of the 500 mile break-in period, you're gonna wanna change your diff fluid um, and then your gears are good to go. So uh, at the time that I'm editing this video, uh, it's actually been a few months since I finished this whole project um, and it's back in the Jeep. The only thing I don't show in the video is me just finishing up uh, painting the axle and then reinstalling. And I'm really happy with how everything turned out. The Jeep drives much better. I would have added more caster, I think, if I were to do it again. I think I could still use a few more degrees of caster, but it is a huge improvement over what it was. Uh, the power tracks locker is awesome. It's super quiet um, and it has increased the capability of the Jeep tenfold. The Jeep just competed in the uh, Southern Expeditions Overland competition uh, in Uwari National Forest about a week ago and uh, it just absolutely killed it. I had a great time and, and it was a super capable truck and it was really all thanks to this locker and, and these, these nice gears that I put in. Um, with the 456 gears you have so much more power and getting over obstacles becomes way easier than um, you know stock gearing with 33s so uh, to anyone trying to tackle this project i say don't be afraid you know you don't have to be an expert mechanic to do this um, you know there's always risk involved with with doing projects like this yourself but um, if i can do it you can do it and uh, i hope this video uh, you know will help everyone kind of have the courage to tackle something like this if I forgot anything, if you have any questions, if there's something you're confused about, um, please feel free to leave it in the comments. I usually check the comments every couple days, um, so I will get back to you, I promise. And uh, thanks for watching. Follow me at Bark Forge. Hoping to get some blacksmithing content out soon, but you know, I've been doing a lot of Jeep stuff lately. So appreciate it if you could leave a comment, if you could leave a like, and if you could please subscribe to the channel, it would mean a lot to me. I look forward to seeing you next time.